Hello and thank you very much for watching this presentation. My name is Ohad Feldheim and I'll be telling you about the power of two choices in graphical allocation, joint work with Nick Hilben Sal from University of Michigan. Let me begin by recalling what is the power of two choices in the classical balls and beans model and how uh, this model was developed into what's known as the graphical balanced allocation. So the general setting of the balls and bean model and the, is the following. M balls are being allocated one by one into one of N beans chosen uniformly at random. We consider this as a model for tasks being assigned to servers. So the balls represent tasks and the beans represent servers. In this context, we consider the load of each server, which is the number of balls allocated to it, and the maximum load, which is the maximum among all the loads of the different servers. We also look on what's known as the maximum gap. This is the difference between the maximum load and the average load. As we must have at least one bin which is at least averagely loaded, this number is non-negative. And in the context of tasks being assigned to servers, we would like this to be as low as possible. Probabilistic computation tell us that for m, which is of order n, this maximum gap is of order log n over log log n with high probability. A different setting is when m, the number of tasks, is much larger than n, the number of servers, in which case the maximum gap could be estimated using the deviation of the normal distribution via the central limit theorem, in which case it is of order square root m log n over n with high probability. What we're going to consider in this talk are what's known as overseer models, models where we have limited online control over the allocation, and our purpose is to reduce the maximum gap. The first model we're going to look at is the classical two choices model. In this model, we are getting two allocation alternatives for each ball, each chosen uniformly at random and independently. It is natural in this context to wish to allocate the ball to the least loaded bin among the two suggested two outputs. And we call this a greedy allocation strategy. And it turns out that greedy strategy is optimal in this setting and that the maximum gap that it yields is significantly smaller than in the no choice setting introduced before. In this case, with two choices, the maximum gap after allocating m balls is log 2 of log n plus, little, plus big O of 1. And if we are given deallocation alternatives for each ball rather than two, we do not see a significant improvement. It only changes the maximum gap by a constant from log 2 log n to log d log n. This result for the case m of order n is due to Azar, Border, Carlin, and Upfall from 94, and it already achieves an exponential improvement. Compare it with the log n over log log n we've seen before. But it is even more astonishing for m greater than n, where previously we've seen maximum gap, which is of order square root m log n over n, so growing with m polynomially. And now it does not depend on m at all. This result is due to Bernbrink, Kuma, Steger, and Woking from 2006. And there's a simpler proof and quite intuitive one by Talwar and Wider from 2014. So following these remarkable results on two choices, there were many developments, uh, variations, generalizations, and applications. And today we're going to consider the graphical two choices. So this was introduced by Perez, Talwar, and Wider in 2015 as graphical balanced allocation. And we look on the bin set in this setting, V, as the vertex set of a deregular graph. So here is a graph. And now every uh, vertex of this graph is representing a bin. And the allocation uh, control scheme that we have now is that for every ball, we get a random edge and we're allowed to allocate the ball to one of its sides. So if we follow a greedy strategy, for example, we now have an edge where one side has a single ball 
and the other side is still empty, so we would allocate it to the empty side. If we are looking on this model for the complete graph, then it is exactly the two choices introduced before. So this is indeed a generalization of the two choices model. And the question is, how does this restriction into fewer uh, possible choices between two members affects the maximum gap? So what Perez, Talwar, and Wider show is that greedy allocation under graphical two choices on a graph which is an expander is a relatively yielding low maximum gap. So what they showed is that the maximum gap is at most log n minus log lambda over lambda if g is lambda expanding. This is most relevant when the number of balls is asymptotically greater than the number of beans, in which case you can see that this yields exponential concentration much better than the a growing uh, a polynomial concentration with m that we had with our choice. But the behavior of greedy graphical allocation on general graphs, which are not necessarily expanders, remains unknown. And there's a conjecture by Perez that relates it to a classical model in statistical mechanics called the Gaussian free field. If it would be true, then it would extend the result to many non-expanders. For example, it would imply that the exponential concentration holds even if we are looking on a three-dimensional discrete torus. However, uh, for cycle graph, for example, or other poorly connected graphs, it would mean that this greedy balanced allocation will yield polynomial maximum gap, which we would consider relatively bad. And indeed, simulations follow the conjecture and suggest that on this graph, the fluctuation caused by the greedy allocation are indeed of order square root n. So you can see a simulation we conducted on different cycle sizes. We run the algorithm 80 times every time until the um, load stabilizes, becomes stationary. And uh, you can see how closely it follows the square root n curve. Now the best known bounds are not so good. So the lower bound is log n and the upper bound is n. So we virtually know almost nothing about the maximum gap on a cycle. But if you want additional evidence beyond the uh, simulative evidence, then Alistrana, Ziradze, and Sabur in 2020 considered an alternative model where we select an edge and we take all the balls from both of its sides and add one more ball and fully balance them among the two sides of the edge, even if it means cutting a ball into two. And they showed that in this stronger balancing model, the maximum gap is of order square root n. So it seems very unlikely that greedy allocation could do any better. So this brings up the question, is the greedy policy for deciding on two choices in the graphical setting always asymptotically optimal? Can we do better than greedy? And if the conjecture and simulations are reliable, then we can do much better than greedy. So the theorem I want to tell you about today is the following. On any k-connected, k-regular graph on n vertices, there exists an allocation strategy for the graphical choice process on G that guarantees for any uh, number of allocations, here T is what we've seen, we've seen before as M, with high probability, the maximum gap is of polylogarithmic order, in particular log to the 4n log log n. The strategy is efficient in several senses. So first, it's allocating in O of one time and requires only k n log n memory. But it can also be distributedly implemented. So although this is a global strategy making complicated considerations and not just allocating by uh, 
looking on the least loaded bin, it does not require a lot of communication and information about what's happening in the graph because it can use very stale estimates on the, on the loads of remote vertices. So in fact, it could be implemented in a distributed way using order of one edge communications per allocation and k log n memory per b. On the cycle graph, this is, of course, an improvement from square root n to a polylogarithmic maximum. And the result is inspired by methods uh, used for two choices in the context of discrepancy. So taking a, a, a random points in, a, a, in the unit cube in high dimensions and trying to make it so that they resemble uh, the uniform distribution when uh, tested against axis aligned rectangles. So in the remainder of the talk, I would like to tell you a bit about the algorithm. How do we achieve this uh, low maximum gap? And the way that I'm going to describe it is through a stochastic process. So I'm going to consider a mixed strategy. It's not essential. One can find an uh, analog deterministic strategy through uh, general theorems. But this would be the more natural way to look on this, at least for the purpose of the analysis. And what I mean by a mixed strategy is that when an edge is coming, I decide with certain probability, which I denote PT of this edge, to allocate to the first vertex, and with the remaining probability to allocate to the second vertex. And I'm going to describe the strategy in terms of these probabilities. So the allocation to any vertex now would be the probability of selecting any particular edge, 2 over n times k, times the sum of the probability of uh, all the neighbors of this vertex, given that the, the uh, connecting edge was, selection, was selected, the probability of allocating to the particular vertex. Now we define the bias of every edge to be the amount by which we tilt it in a sense. So the difference between the probability of allocating to you and the probability of allocating to v if this edge is selected. So if this is half and half, the bias is zero. And we can think of such a bias as a flow, as it draws probability from allocating to v and moves it to probability to allocate to u. And such a flow induces a drift, so the total change in allocation probability, and we normalize it in the following way. We define the drift at u to be the sum of the biases over the edges involving u. And if we take this drift and divide it by kn, then this would be the probability of allocating to u minus the probability if we would allocate at random whenever we get an edge. And we generalize this to say that the drift of a set is the sum of the drifts of the vertices containing it. Now we say that the drift is realizable on a graph if we can find biases in minus 1, 1 that induce it, which would correspond to the ability to find probabilities of allocating that induce this drift. So if there are proper probabilities of allocating to u and to v for every edge, given that the edge was chosen, that induce a drift, it's a realizable drift. And we are going to now define which drifts are desirable for us that would result exponential concentration in the scale that we're interested in, in uh, establishing. And then we will make sure that we can actually realize them in a reasonable way. So in order to explain what drifts are desirable for us, what we need is to provide a balanced binary decomposition of V. So what you can see here is a graph on 10 vertices, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and K. In each vertex here, you see a small bin representing it and a balls which represent its present load. So we're already in the middle of the process. And for this graph, we provide a well-balanced binary decomposition, which means that we are partitioning the graph into two sets, then each of these into two sets, and so on and so forth, until we are left with just single vertices. And the depth of these three of sets will be constant log n. 
Now, in order to control the maximum load, we are going to use a classical proposition from uh, the theory of self-regulating processes. And its implication in this context is the following. Suppose that we have two sibling sets, and suppose, for sake of simplicity, that they are of the same size, so they have the same number of beans in them. If, at all times, the drift toward the least loaded set is bigger than the drift towards the more loaded set, by a factor of at least epsilon, the degree of the graph, then the uh, difference between the average loads of the two sets will be exponentially concentrated in units of epsilon. So if we can enforce our drift to satisfy this property with respect to every pair of sibling sets, it would imply exponential concentration in units of epsilon and maximum gap, which is of order log n times epsilon. So how can we create such a drift that balances well every two sets? Well, we can find the drift for every pair and superimpose them in such a way that we do not uh, cause too much imbalance on n reach. So always between minus one and one. So let's do it in a naive way. So I put more information into this uh, 3D composition. Now in every node, I have two numbers. The bottom one is the number of beans in the set. So here it's 10, the entire graph, and every half is five and so on. The top one is the current load of all the beans together. So the total load of the graph is 11, and here we have four uh, balls in the set A, B, C, D, E, and seven balls in the set F, G, H, I, J, and so on. The red arrows tell us what is the bias of uh, the section separating the child set from the remainder of the graph. Now here we are trying to bias the two sets uh, in the highest level of the hierarchy towards the least loaded on average in the simplest possible way by biasing all the edges outgoing from the heavy set outwards and all the edges going into the lightly loaded set inwards and you can see that indeed the difference between their uh, drifts which is the difference between the incoming arrows from the parent to each of them is six epsilon which is great what we wanted is three which is the uh, degree times the constant times epsilon however this naive solution has a problem because if we look further down the hierarchy and look on the set CDE and the set AB represented here, AB has average load of one half because it's one ball over two beans. CDE has average load of one because these are three balls over three beans. So we would like to bias our graph towards AB and away from CDE. But this attempt to rebalance the highest level of the hierarchy damaged the balance in the uh, level below it because we are biasing towards the more heavily loaded set. So that's not good. What we want is an orthogonal flow, a flow that rebalances a pair of sibling sets without affecting the relative drift relative to the size of every pair of uh, sibling uh, sets inside the tree except these two. Now there's a very easy way to do it in terms of defining the drift. It's not so clear how to do it in terms of assigning biases to edges. We look on the hierarchical decomposition and we observe that if for every child set of the uh, one of the siblings we are drawing away a constant number of uh, units of drift and into every child of the incoming a, a set of the set which is lightly loaded in the upper hierarchy we are inducing positive drift of a constant size then the relative drifts of every two sibling sets in each of the subtrees will not be modified so our plan is to try and realize orthogonal flows of this type for every pair of sibling sets and superimpose them let's make this more precise so using our hierarchical decomposition R, 
we define for every pair of sibling cells a flow on the graph, which we need to find yet, that has the property that the drift that it induces is drawing minus epsilon over the size of L1 from every vertex in L1 and pushing it into epsilon over L0, size of L0, for every vertex in L0. This drift uh, causes indeed to a drift difference between L0 and L1 of 2 epsilon, but the drift difference between every two siblings in the tree except for these two will be zero. So all of these drifts will be orthogonal. And we want it to be such that superimposing any of these flows with arbitrary signs will always be feasible, so that for any choice of signs, the total biasing of every edge will be between minus one and one. And if we can do this, then using the concentration estimate we've seen before, we will have maximum gap of one over epsilon log. So how can we find such a collection of orthogonal flows? So first let's discuss flows on the tree decomposition itself. So we view the tree decomposition as a graph, and for every edge in this tree, we assign a capacity, a maximum flow we allow in it, which is proportional to the number of edges in the section of the child set to the remainder of the graph. And we are therefore guaranteed, because the graph is k-connected, that this capacity is at least k for every edge. Now on the tree itself, it's very easy to analyze which flows could be realized, because there is only one way to flow a unit of drift from every vertex to every other vertex by going up to up the tree and then down in the shortest possible way. And so we can see that every such drift can impose on every edge at most k epsilon drift, and the tree has log n many levels, so it is feasible to realize a, such a flow with arbitrary signs for epsilon which is 1 over log n. So on the tree we could achieve log square n maximum gap with high probability. But we don't want to flow on the tree, we want to flow on the graph. So what can we do? Can we find a flow on G using the flow on the tree? The answer is yes, and this is due to a theorem by Reke, known as the Reke tree decomposition, that tells us that every graph G has a well-balanced hierarchical decomposition R and a set of flow templates for every vertex to every other vertex, such that if we have a demand vector which is realizable on the tree, we can realize it on the graph by replacing every uh, flow pattern of the, on the tree from one vertex to the other with this flow pattern biasing scheme on the uh, graph G. And we can do this by paying a factor of at most log square n log log n. So that's the sigma. So this means that by subdividing this record decomposition into a binary tree, we can realize the flow template that we wanted, but we need to pay additional log square n log log n in the typical maximum gap, and so we arrive at log to the 4 log log n. Let me conclude by showing you a simulation. So here the red line represents the uh, greedy strategy maximum gap. The blue one is the gap obtained by our strategy. And you can see that indeed it offers an improvement and nearly flattens out as the cycle size goes. So the greedy appears to be non-optimal for graphical allocation. And using record decomposition and orthogonal flows, we were able to describe an efficient and easy to distribute algorithm for obtaining always poly logarithmic maximum gap. We conjecture that this cannot be matched by any local algorithm, considering only the load on a vertex and its near vicinity. And it remains open to show any better lower bound than log n for graphical two choices on k-connected k-regular graphs. So for example, it would be interesting to see a log square lower bound for any algorithm on the cycle. I thank you very much for listening to this presentation.